Yes, so thanks everyone for attending. I'm really happy uh, to be doing part two. Um, I think that some of you joined us for part one and if not, that that was um, a recording is posted on our website and we were talking more so about organizational basics around AI ML. And um, as we were mentioning before we started recording, when we were talking to one of the attendees, sometimes figuring out what it is that you're even doing as an organization in terms of um, organizing your data science teams, organizing your ML questions is, yeah, like feels like half the battle. Um, and so although today we're going to be talking about find, framing problems in terms of ML and thinking about data for ML, there's a few things that I sort of wanted to, to talk about, just sort of me thinking from our last webinar, right? And some of those things are just that it's really, really easy to get excited and sort of overwhelmed with trying to shift the way an organization does their research to a machine learning workflow. There's a lot of excitement and a lot of pressure sometimes it feels like, and especially if you've been charged um, with starting a whole team. And sometimes I think that, you know, when something like our webinar comes across or millions of other webinars on AI and ML, um, there's this sort of feeling of like, all right, we're gonna, we're gonna go, we're gonna listen, we're gonna figure it out. You're maybe like feeling good, feeling excited about it. And then perhaps you start doing some research, like, okay, so let's figure out some tools for this data. And so for example, I went to uh, Matt Truck's um, review on what's hot in AI today. And this image came up, which was all of the different tools that are available for AI ML at the moment. And then I think sometimes we just lose focus and it starts feeling just like slightly overwhelming. And like, there's so much going on that it's hard to get a hold on things. And there's not a lot of sort of stability. There's no sort of dominant, consistent players. Even the tools that are out there, they seem to sort of not have clear boundaries around them. And so a tool comes out and then it starts trying to do other things. Um, and then if you have an IT department that's very well aware of machine learning, you still have to bring in the research aspect, especially if you're um, a pharmaceutical or a biopharma company or you're, you're working on drug development, you have to incorporate the research side. And so, especially with science, we see that sometimes it's just really hard to get change in the way that scientists um, do their work and sort of track their data, have ownership of their data. And so I just wanted to say to anyone who's watching this or anyone who's on the call now that having this sort of feeling like you're a little bit in a, in a weird place with ML is not unusual. Most organizations, I would say, except for the ones that are true giants with machine learning and AI, um, are sort of in this place of uncertainty. Because again, the tools really are all over the place and consensus will take time. We will get to consensus, I'm sure we will. And to me, when I think about it, it's like, if I think about the way that DevOps um, developed, it was really a multi-decade transformation, right? So in the IT side, software engineers and IT used to operate as silos, the same way that now IT and science operates as silos, right? Um, and eventually they came together into, into a DevOps team. And eventually science and IT will come together into something like MLOps or machine learning and sort of break through those inefficiencies. Um, but there is a period of time that, that, that is just going to have to pass for that to happen. And there's really gonna be a need for cross-functional skills. And so essentially like our goal um, is to help organizations make that transition as Maybe it's slow, maybe it's uncertain, but to really get there. And some of the things that I think are just important is to engage experienced teams or folks um, to help consider options, do some POCs, think through different technologies. And the reason why I wanted to do this sort of second webinar on problem ideation is because I think it really is important to just start seeing your organization through the lens of are these questions good for machine learning at all? Um, and then maybe starting with machine learning at a very small and reasonable scale. And then just generally accepting that things are in flux, um, tools are in flux, and eventually there probably will be, in fact, certainly will be things that become standard um, that we can rely on, but it's just not, not at the moment. And so, yeah, that's essentially where, where we work. And I think all of you know about BioTeam that we do try to bring together these sort of 
teams that feel separate but really need to work together in an organization. And I have a feeling that as we did introductions on our call, a lot of you on the call are doing the same thing for your organization. You're trying to bring together research, you're trying to bring together research data with some kind of computational needs. Um, and so it'll be really interesting to talk through the webinar and have a little bit of feedback from everyone on sort of how that's um, you know, playing out for, for all of your teams. Because I think part of it is also not just me, me talking, but us sort of forming those relationships and connections and helping each other through the you know through this process and that's the goal of us doing this webinar honestly is to just introduce ourselves to each other and um, start on the journey together and hopefully we can help you and you know you can help somebody else etc cetera, etc cetera. and so the way that we sort of frame it in our head is there's three phases is this ready set and go and the ready phase is the organizational aspects then the set is the framing your problem and getting your data and the go is the training um, using your model and deploying your model which we will do next um, like phase three of the webinar and i'll have one of my colleagues sam come and do that because he knows much more about actually um, deploying and using models for our clients and in general um, everything has to fit together to make machine learning or really any successful data science team work, right? So you have to have efficient access to shared research applications, to workflows, analytics. You have to always converge data from multiple distributed devices, lab equipment. You need centralized resources. Um, you have to have shared network capabilities. You need data strategies, data management, harmonized data access, a lot of things. And again, this is sort of the place where it can feel um, really overwhelming, right? Because we know we need all these things and yet sometimes we are charged. So it depends. I think a few of you mentioned that you're coming from organizations which are brand new, which is nice because you can organize things differently. But if you're in a legacy organization and it's a big legacy organization, then shifting these things um, has its own challenges unrelated, you know, which are just different than a small agile organization. Um, but it all sort of needs to start happening, whether for ML or not, for us to really make use of all this data that we have gathered um, over time. And so what we're gonna be doing today is trying to talk through, is my problem suitable for machine learning? Um, and do I have the appropriate data? And I think that it's, it's so interesting the way that the human mind is just fascinated with certain things and thinks that it's, um, that it's a great option even when it's not a great option. I was talking to my friend um, at work the other day and we were talking about different scenarios where machine learning just happened to sound good, but was actually completely the wrong solution. And I think that make really good analogies for how we could sort of get overexcited, right? So one of them, he was saying that, and I'm sure you could have heard this, but there was um, a hospital that wanted to track whether or not their clinicians were washing their hands before surgeries. And so they set up this elaborate system with like a camera that did image recognition and then like uh, classified whether or not the water was turned on or off in the person, et cetera. And then someone suggested for all of that effort, they could have just put a, a click counter on the faucet to see whether or not water turned on or off, right? And then compared it to the number of surgeries that were happening. Um, and so sometimes in our enthusiasm, we forget that there's simpler solutions that don't require full organizational transformation. And that's okay. But for the problems that really do require machine learning, it's good to know that this is actually what's needed in order to, to solve this problem. Um, and why do we even need to frame a problem for machine learning? Well, in machine learning, when you're developing a problem, you have to understand that the data and the problem or the task are very much interconnected, right? They drive each other. And you have to approach it sort of from one of two, two perspectives to get into the loop. You can access it from the perspective of, you know, the question, will patients respond to a treatment, for example? And then you need to gather the data um, for that question. Or you can start with the data. So you have the data of patients and then you can say, okay, which of my models or which of the available um, machine learning algorithms that's on the market can I actually use in order to discover something about my data? But those two things sort of become an interconnected cycle. And so you, you need them to work har harmoniously together. And of course, the question of what we want to do, what we want to do depends on the type of learning and what we want the model to do. Um, 
So this could be very basic for a lot of people, but I'll just go over it very quickly. If in a very basic sense, we could split learning into supervised and unsupervised when we're trying to think about problem ideation. So in supervised learning, the algorithm is actually fed the information, right? And in unsupervised, it has to make its own conclusion. So when you think about the problem, you have to think about whether or not we're going to need to um, to think about it from one of those two perspectives. Do we want the machine to make its own conclusions that we then analyze, or do we want to start making, uh, training the model and training the problem to make some kind of conclusions down the road? So for example, of supervised learning is bio image segmentation, where the goal is to determine a 3D structure of neurons, but you have a model that creates first bin binary images and then reconstructs them to a structure. And so an example of unsupervised learning could be if you wanna, for example, just reduce dimensionality in a transcriptome. Um, and I'll give sort of further examples of this, but there's no ground truth in this example. So uh, you actually just wanna reduce vector size uh, to understand the transcriptome a little bit better. And so we have to understand the sort of potential of what we could do in order to understand what kind of question we have. Um, and then we have to think that, do we want to predict a numerical value? Do we want to find an anomaly? Do we want to classify or do we want to cluster, right? So how, how do we form a problem? If our problem doesn't necessarily fit into any of these categories, most likely or possibly it's not an appropriate problem for machine learning. So do we need to, for regression, predict a response to a drug treatment? Uh, do we need to find outliers through screening? Um, in which case, so all of these have nuance, right? But I just wanted to put this here because this sort of makes it sound simplistic, but just be careful because if you use a heuristic to label your anomalies, then machine learning can't be better than the heuristic used to, to train it. So there's all, there's all these little nuances that sort of take time to, to figure out. And that's fine, that's part of the development process. Um, do you want to classify like responses or do you want to cluster and just sort of explore? Um, and so one of the things about framing question for machine learning is sort of understanding how the output will be created for you. And the difference with machine learning is that you're really starting to rely on statistics to answer natural science questions, not really on your sort of scientific logic, which can feel tricky um, because the machine learning model is going to interpret your signals differently than a human would interpret your signals. So the model embeds knowledge and intelligence by um, through like, you know, numerical trees or outputs that are difficult, quote, difficult for humans to understand, but let's say not innately of human understanding. And so it's important to have your assumptions challenged when you start showing your outputs or models to researchers and they want to understand, which they, you know, of course makes sense of how did this model come to this conclusion? And it's important for data science teams to, um, to communicate the fact that machine learning models come to conclusions in their own way. And of course there's a level of understanding we can have, but it's going to be different than the way that you would have come to a conclusion. And sort of from our experience with really nascent teams, we I would say that the easiest problems are, are really framed in a binary fashion, classification um, or unidimensional regression. So those are really both well-traversed ap approaches and have lots of tooling and expert support in them. And so if you have a question that is sort of can be framed in a yes or no binary classification, and a lot of uh, scientific questions can be, those are the ones that are the easiest to start off with. And it's also a way for us to sort of see whether or not our machine learning questions are appropriate, right? Like, can we ask the machine to actually, and, and I know that it's called predictions, right? Machine learning makes predictions, but what we're actually asking it to do is make a decision at some point, whether or not it thinks something is yes or no. Is it a cat or a dog um, or a panda, right? Is it is this drug a likely target, yes or no? Or is this um, cell type, you know, the right cell type, yes or no? Um, and the one thing that I would sort of warn against in this in our scenario is just not to use machine learning for causation. Um, machine learning can sort of help identify correlations, of course, and co connections, but I think a lot of organizations get excited because they think that machine learning through its learning will uncover um, causes, especially between uh, like drugs and disease and, um, and interactions. And it will in some sense, but not in a causal sense, especially not from just observational data. And 
I would also say that for some teams that we talk to, if your goal is really to just explore um, and find out something interesting, statistics probably makes more sense. Um, the probability that something will happen, for example, or a fraction of the population that responds or the order of drugs that's most effective. And so it's fine to, um, and, and you can save your organization a lot of money by choosing another method that isn't going to force um, the adoption of a bunch of new workflows. And so here I wanted to just sort of have your, uh, your input and sort of let's I don't know, let's practice developing questions for ML. So maybe we can um, feel free to just have me call on you and then we can sort of talk through questions that you feel like could be appropriate for machine learning. Um, so no need to be shy. I'll just call on Eduardo since we talked about plans. Let's talk about machine learning questions. Um, how, like what's a question that you think could be used or devised for you know, research in your teams? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, yeah. In in any of the ones that you mention, uh, I okay. think that they are they are appropriate. Um, but let's uh, let's uh, say hypothetically. I'm not saying that mm -hmm. uh, or yeah, not. Yeah, this is that totally hypothetical. To this. Right. This is hypothetical. Right. We have um, uh, microscopy images of okay. cells. And we want to classify or train them into telling me if a cell is cancerous or not. Gotcha. Great. That's a fantastic way to frame it. Is this cell cancerous? Yes or no. Uh, very simple image classification, probably a super something supervised where you have training methods that say that this is a cancerous cell, this is not a cancerous cell, and then you want the machine to keep predicting, making decisions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. something like that right yeah mm -hmm. great fantastic and i mean that reduces the complexity right because of course there's different images there's different ways they were taken it probably requires some sort of uh feature reduction and identification of what what is the cell which is the cell that you're actually trying to analyze so within that there's a lot more complexity but yeah that's a great question but it, uh, but it's but it's something that uh it, to me is very important because it's a tedious task that if somebody needs to do it, it takes quite some time. Yes. Uh, I think that people are much better, to your point, at judging, right? Uh, is this really a cat or a dog, right? Uh, but the alg an algorithm can do it much faster, uh, A, and B, much more important, an algorithm is going to do it consistently. Great. The same person doing this today and tomorrow is going to have a different judgment, and the ML is going to have the exact same judgment, right? I love that. That's I and I didn't, you know what? I didn't even put that in here. Um, but you're absolutely right. Something that is so tedious for a human to do is so simple for a, a machine to do, for a com computational machine to do. Absolutely, that's a great point. Thank you for bringing that up. I didn't even put it in the in the presentation. Um, Kilway, what about you guys on your side, on your team? Okay. Um, so in the past, what I've done um, at my old job was trying to figure out kind of, it, it sort of touches upon some of the things that you mentioned before. What we were trying to do, what we were trying to do was use our own clinical data to figure out what were the specific gene signatures that would predict the patient's response to our drugs. Okay. That sounds pretty, uh, pretty broad though, right? Because you know that you have a patient, you know you have your response and you're sort of like um, hoping so, for a gene signature. Yeah, so we went at this um, kind of in a two way. So we had our own signatures, in-house signatures that we were pretty confident okay. would, um, would yield a significant response to our patients, our patients um, with our drug. And then in reverse, we also tried to sort of take away that signature and see what the model will come up as a feature um, uh, that, that would be a better predictor of response. And surprisingly, it was there was good overlap between the two. So that gave us a little bit more confidence that our in-house signature had some significant lead or yield into predicting a patient's response to our drugs. 
That's so cool. That's great. So you guys sort of approached it from both sides, right? From sort of yeah. like a training on a truth and then seeing if there is no truth, if that will ev emerge as the truth. And we, we, you could try that, I mean, with other features too. It doesn't have to be genes. So we even looked at like um, patient demographic data as well. Okay. And a, a lot of different features to see what other um, interesting information we could extract from that data set. Yeah, so I think, and I'm, I'm kind of curious, we're sort of fast forwarding, but since we're talking, I think it's worth the conversation, right? So in that context, whenever you're exploring those features, I guess, like what, what would have been your methodology for thinking through whether or not those are really generalizable conclusions or just something specific to, you know, your experimentation and to, you know, to your date, to your specific data set, right? So um, I guess like, how would you navigate that, that internal conversation? Yeah, so that was a big challenge for us at the end of the day, because our, our I think this is a lot of, issues that a lot of pharmaceutical companies are facing. The data yeah, set, yeah. the clinical trial data sets that we had were so small, right? The patient number size mm -hmm. was equal to right. two digits. And so we couldn't really draw any, con even though we could draw conclusions from our model, um, we couldn't really 100% say that this is, oh, we have found that signature, gene signature that we know will predict response. We know that fingerprint of that patient that will respond. Right. We weren't that confident. And so in order to gain extra confidence, we had to look at external data, public domain data that could right. additional end data that we could feed into our model to see whether if we see the similar sort of effect, but that's also hard to do, right? In the field of by, uh, biotech, it's really hard to find patient data that's public that people are willing to offer for free. So yeah. That, and it's really that. hard to even like share models or share anything about the way that you did your analysis, right? Like you don't, maybe you choose not to share data, but then someone's like, oh, I have data if you just share your model. And all of that is really tricky. All of those collaborations are super tricky. Yeah. Yeah, very cool. Thanks. Prakash, you want to tell us anything about um, what you've had experience with? I know that you're from a company, so you don't have to be specific. Uh, no, I don't have any input right now. Okay. No problem. Thanks. Yeah, so um, I think that those are really great examples. And I think that I love that we covered sort of the the spectrum of it, right? So Eduardo's question was very specific. Cell type cancers, yes, no. Um, and Kilauea and her, you know, generalized example, it was a very sort of exploratory question, which is which is beautiful, but also difficult to really prove because in order to understand whether or not the machine is over, over sort of emphasizing specific features, uh, you have to then expand your data tremendously in order to um, in order to verify that. And so you're sort of on both spectrums of machine learning, something that is just very computational um, and simple to something that is sort of really gets at the artificial intelligence aspect of it, but it's just going to require a huge amount more data and more time. And those are all things that organizations are sort of struggling with. Um, but so I know that for us probably here, this is slightly underwhelming, but I think for other people listening, um, machine learning has data, of course, and data is just an input that you that you use to make a conclusion, right? And there's labels for the variables we're predicting, there's features which are sort of describing the data. And you can ask your model in general to sort of map examples to labels. So again, cell type cancer is yes or no. Um, and it can then predict unlabeled data, or you can um, ask it to define a relationship between feature and label. So in this case, sort of gene expression and disease status or gene expression and, um, you know, gene signature and drug response, right? So our examples fit perfectly into that. And I just put in some examples of things that we've seen um, and methods that are really well developed already. And so if you're listening to this and you think, oh, like that sounds interesting, just so you know, these are things that are already very well developed. And if you want to use these, the models and the algorithms are already um, out there. So some of the things we've heard for genomics is like, is like prediction of function. So it's similar to a signature, except it's a function. So you input sequences, which it's not truly sequences because most likely if you're doing deep learning, you're actually reducing the, um, there's a feature reduction of those of those sequences, but we'll pretend that we're putting in sequences. And then your labels are based on general scientific agreement of which 
um, you know, DNA code aligns to what biological function. And so in this case, again, sort of like our cell classification example, you're just using brute compute power in order to bring your model to map those sequences to the labels and then provide you an output of biological function associated with non-coding DNA. And so this is, of course, a, a supervised approach because you as the scientists are saying these are the labels that signify um, a biological function. I guess another way that you could do it is you could, um, you know, in, not in this exact example, but you could put in a sequence and see how it correlates and predicts and clusters things to try to identify specific fun functions related to different features. And then as well, there's image segmentation, which is also a very well-developed tool. So you can take um, images um, and help, or in this example, you would use um, um, input data of images that are, are uh, going through something like a unit and the images are then used to generate features. And your labels are based on the boundaries that have been manually curated. So again, you're training the model to say, okay, this is the boundary of a cell. This is not the boundary of a cell. And then you run all your examples of images through this machine learning model. And in the end, you get an output of a binary image that says all of these are um, all your cells. And if you've taken an insane amount of images, it helps to not have to do this by hand. And then once you're finished doing that, you can come to any conclusion you want um, from those images. You can reconstruct 3D structures of neurons or whatever it is that it takes um, from those images, but you didn't have to do the manual labor yourself. And these kinds of tools are widely available. Um, and if you want something that's a little less sort of biomedical, but still very, very helpful is just using uh, natural language processing. Also a lot of models very widely available, available. In this case, you're just highlighting medical literature. So it's not your grad student or your PhD student who's sitting there having to read passages, but your input data that are queries and texts um, and your fe features are the vectors generated by that text. And you sort of label manually the things that you think are relevant in, in your query. And then your model will output regions of text that are also then relevant to your query. Um, and this potentially saves times for researchers scanning through medical literature to answer a question, which I know that especially um, in our busy times, it's hard to sit down and read and extract important information from literature. And so it sounds a little bit less exciting, but I think that those are the things that we sort of forget about in, in terms of machine learning and organizations is that sometimes the thing that sounds a little bit more enterprisey and a little less like biomedically exciting could actually be the biggest saver of time, depending on what your organization is really doing. Um, and then again, we have our, uh, our example of ex uh, gene expression compression for cancer diagnosis. So if you have a lot of gene expression vectors that you put in, um, and in this case, you don't want labels. So it's sort of like uh, in our previous example where you just wanna reduce dimensionality. And so you wanna see which of these things is I think are actually important. And then from those, I can sort of parse my own understanding of what is truly a gene signature. But I want the model to sort of clear away all the stuff that I think um, is just going to confuse me in this case. Um, so these can be useful as inputs for other models downstream or for just clustering and visualization, depending on your ability to sort of analyze the, uh, the reduced down analysis. And again, it's sort of using machine learning for, um, for managing huge data outputs um, and then leaving a large amount of analysis for the clinician or the researcher to do. And these are all great for, um, for, um, for biomedical, for biomedical teams to do. And so I was thinking that we would do this, but we sort of already did it with our previous examples. Um, but I guess I'm kind of curious, since we're talking about widely available models, I would ask you guys, um, if, you, if you rely on published tools or if you were always developing in-house tools um, for your models? And I'll start with Eduardo. Um, or if you, since you're putting together a team, are you trying to, what sort of your, or you don't have to tell me your strategy, pretend it's hypothetical. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's, it's a great question. So right now we're doing this very ad hoc, right? Okay. So I'll tell you and uh, I'm not 100% sure that what I'm saying is really correct because it's within the scientific teams. Yeah. And what we're doing right now is that my job is to figure out if we want to do this at scale and put data science as a capability at the institutional level, just gotcha. like we have 
uh, research storage and we have HPC, we want to bring that to an institutional level, right? Mm -hmm. But what I can tell you from what I know and going back to that example, is this a cancer cell or not? Mm -hmm. This is a postdoc that is coming to a lab, right? They might have had very little exposure with uh, machine learning. Mm -hmm. And what they're doing is they're finding examples where these uh, uh, algorithms already exist mm -hmm. somewhere. They're mm -hmm. going to GitHub uh, mm -hmm. out of a publication. They're downloading that and they are trying to adapt that for their particular need. They're trying right. to fine tune that or to reuse uh, an existing algorithm that might be relevant for them. And the goal is that they would then come, because so I find this organizational stuff so interesting. So then, then there are research and then they would come to the data science team or they would be part of the data science team already. Uh, in, in this case, so there is no data science team yet. But in theory, <laughs> in theory, like as we're developing it, right? Like yeah, in yeah, theory, yeah. So, they would then so, reference the data science team or be part yes. of it. I, th I think that the data science team would have the ability to say, uh, so this is a relevant model that you can use for your problem. I see. Uh, and uh, even educate them a little bit. These are... Uh, so your question is going through your problem statement. Yeah. Your question is relevant. Here yes. the your input is relevant for answering that question. Yeah. Here is what you need to do in terms of labeling your yes. uh, the proper label. And these are the features that you're going to have to work on in order to get the output that you want. And it so, would be yes. an edu almost an educational uh, 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 journey for the data, data science specialists to help the person. In the end, you, you, you cannot have enough data scientists to solve e every data science problem in the world. So you need to have experts that maybe they know enough about uh, uh, image uh, data science questions and they mm -hmm. can guide you whether you want to recognize and count the number of cancer cells or you want to define the boundary of your cancer growth or any other question if you have the right uh if you're on the right path yes um i am so excited about that you definitely need that team um and you need them to sit close to um the compute, whoever is running your computer, whoever is holding it, because then they're going to have to essentially bridge that scientist to then help them run that data and the algorithm on a uh, some kind of internal compute cluster, right, or whatever cloud or whatever you guys have set up. Um, and so that data science team is going to be so integral for bridging that researcher and the infrastructure that exists at your organization and helping them sort of like make that journey, because otherwise that researcher would have a great idea, but they wouldn't know what to do with it. And even if they could know what to do with it, they wouldn't know where to run it. Um, so absolutely, that's that's the way to do it. And, and I'm going to say one more thing and then I'm going to shut up. Uh, the analogy that I'm not as smart as you are or any of the other participants. So I, I have to use very simple terms for my brain to capture it. So uh, the analogy that I use is, and I've used it earlier today in a different forum, is that the team that I'm trying to build is like a pit crew in Formula One, right? They need to be able to communicate with the pilot. That's the scientist asking the questions, right? Yes. right? So that uh, it go and it goes both ways. They need to be able to tell that dry pilot, right? Uh, hey, uh, you're driving too fast and you're pressing too hard on the brakes. Be careful when you go into curve number one and three because your left uh, brake pad is running hot. Yeah. Uh, but he needs, they need also to be able to understand the other way around when the pilot, when the driver, right, that has less technical knowledge, but it's actually driving, it's piloting, it's right. trying to right. win the race. When they call in in the radio and say, there is something weird when I go into the chicane and I'm feeling a weird noise uh, over my left ear. They need to translate what could be wrong with the machine, with the, with the car, with the Formula One car, 
that uh, uh, we can do and the solutions need to come in zero time, right? If you're not in and out of the pit in <laughs> five seconds, you lost the race. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, the, the timeliness, I mean, it's, you know, um, don't put too much pressure on yourself, right? Like if a scientist comes with a question and someone tells them, figure out your, your, your input labels and features that time, it's going to take him time. But yes, eventually, eventually it will become a well-oiled machine. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, initially, it's going to take time, right? Like it's, you're going to be one person, but yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, great. So let's try to... Uh, trek through um, the rest and then we can chat at the end because I think the chatting is the more interesting thing, but just in case we we have people who will watch this, they need to have more information. Um, so of course, with input data, whatever data you collect for your specific task is always going to be the most useful, right? But that just may not be practical. If a scientist comes and says, this is my question, of course, initially, ideally you would tell them, okay, collect data for that exact question, right? With all those features and labels, um, but that's not always gonna be possible. And then it's important to really ask yourself, um, the thing that you're trying to predict, is your feature going to change over time? Do we have to think about versioning? And um, I know that sometimes scientists are, are really hard, are really difficult to deal with in, in terms of this because they edit their data and then they don't version it. And then it's really hard to keep track of the governance of it and who changed what. And, uh, you know, this is really important for machine learning algorithms for us to be able to understand how the data changed, keep data current. And then there's this necessity of features question. And I think that this gets to our sort of discussion of those that gene signature example. And that is that if you give your model a lot of different features, it will start predicting that things are relevant to your example, but it's actually um, not necessarily relevant. And so it is possible that you're going to wind up with overly complicated, expensive models that are filled with unimportant features. Like it, it feels interesting to say, okay, uh, like which of these demographic features are going to really predict whether or not you're going to respond to a specific drug. Um, but with smaller data sets, you just have a really high chance that a feature is going to be correlated with your label by chance, um, just because of the way that you sampled your data. And if you have a lot of features without a hypothesis, it's very possible to falsely believe there's relevant signals from your model. And it's sort of, it can be tricky and it can take a lot of time to untangle um, those hypotheses because they sound so interesting. Um, and you really aren't going to catch this flaw until you try to make predictions down the, down the road and they just don't generalize. Um, and so it's just important to, to think of those things like, do is this a feature that we really need in this model or are we just sort of hoping it's gonna yield something exciting for us? Um, because again, to the next point, are we gonna need to tease apart this correlation um, and is it really going to most likely be useful for us? And then we just have to think about our feedback loops and what we do with, um, with data from machine learning and sort of the way that it evolves and moves over time within an organization. And then what's really important is to really think about that output data. So when you have a scientist that comes, you have to say, okay, whatever the output, it has to be quantifiable. So the easiest, again, is just those binary outputs, right? Clear definition, yes or no. Um, and maybe you need a proxy label for the thing that you want to know. For example, if you want to know if a patient responds to a drug, right? Like what is your proxy label for the response? Um, is it, you know, is it time to remission? Is it, you know, visits back to the hospital? Is it really something quantifiable and trackable? And can it really provide a decent predictive signal? And is it really close to your ideal outcome? So that's a really important question to ask yourself because your output, so should, should you say output, connected to your ideal outcome, your output should be something that is very close to the outcome that you want to achieve, right? Do you, in, in labeling a drug successful, the thing that you're measuring, is that what you really want to accomplish for the patient? So your measure should be related to the thing that you actually want to accomplish with your outcome. And then it's just really important to think about some some sort of nitty gritty things like in quality. So quality is of course not nitty gritty, but sort of the, the, the features of quality. Um, and as a general rule of, rule of thumb, your model should train on at least an order of magnitude more examples 
than trainable parameters. So simple models on large data sets are generally better than fancy models on small data sets. And I think we all sort of know that, but we're all limited by the fact that we just don't have large data sets, especially in clinical, clinical predictions. Um, and so with that mindset, quality data, um, a quality data set is the one thing that really lets you succeed with the problem that you care about. Um, and what is quality, right? So you have to think about like, how common are your labeling errors? So Eduardo, if you, if you have a data science team, they're gonna have to look at your researchers data and say, how common are labeling errors here? How noisy are your features? Um, have you even filtered your features properly for your problem? Do you have a lot of omitted values, duplicated examples, bad labels or bad feature values? And all of these things sort of should hint to you that your data is not of sufficient quality to even sort of um, use up additional resources about. And so from our examples, um, some of the things you wanna think about is like what data formats are needed. And sometimes we don't think about this, but some models are just really well trained to specific data formats, for example, images. And sometimes it's interesting because you can take a scientific problem and turn it into an image problem and you, and you don't think about it that way, but you can because image classification is a, such a well trained machine learning model. And we don't think of a lot of our biological problems as image problems, but they can be. So can we use, can we turn it into a different format that is better for the model, for example? Um, and what is the size and resolution of our data? And this is especially important um, when talking about biomedical things, because sometimes, for example, if we do, um, so there's a, a very typical example where Google trained an algorithm to predict retinal um, disease based on on a lot of their data. And the model was an incredibly successful predicted eye disease with incredible accuracy. But when they sent it into the field, they realized that the, that the machines that were actually working in the field couldn't ever provide the resolution of images that the model was trained on. They were just much poor quality images. And if they wanted to take higher quality images, they didn't have the network capabilities to, to send those images in real time to the algorithm to get them back to the doctor for analysis. And so it's really important to think of some of these mundane things, size resolution, um, is your data gonna change over time? Will you be buying a new instrument next year? And so actually the format and the size and the resolution will all change. And so your model will have to be retrained or data collected again. Um, and do you have enough even training data, um, not even speaking about full model data? And just, things about labeling. Do you have direct or do you just have derived labels? Your model is really on, only going to be as good as the connection between your label and your actual desired prediction or decision. And then you have to really think about where's what is the source of your label and is the label connected to your decision? So it's sort of that like is the output connected to your decision that you're trying to make. And then just some dry things about data storage considerations. So a lot of organizations we see are really shifting to storing data. Um, they're trying to think of better ways to store data. Um, and specifically, AI and ML creates certain challenges for that because you really require storage that's both fast and highly efficient because you need to not only get at your data quickly, but you're continuously getting at your data and you need it if it's... E if, especially if you need it sort of in real time medical settings, you need it immediately delivered back to you. Um, and so there's also challenges around tiering and archiving data. And so it really forces an organization to have to rethink the way that they do their data life cycle. And scientists, if it's research data are um, even less sort of aware of how they use their data and how they archive it and tier it and version it and sort of manage it. And so machine learning really does provide issues for, for those kinds of considerations. And there's an increased adoption of graph and network-based storage and database solutions in terms of organizations that are going through ML sort of transformations. And of course, if you have time series data for IoT or some kind of sensors, you're gonna require a totally different uh, storage and database paradigm. Um, and integrating pre-trained models, what we've seen in sort of on-device learning um, on edge computing is kind of becoming the, the trend or the go-to in this case. And then I just wanna really talk about something that has become really, really close to, to sort of my heart is bias and ethics. Um, 
in the way that we develop AI models. And so the bias part of it is really sort of the way that we gather the data, right? So do we just report on things that we think are important, which is reporting bias? Is there selection bias in the fact that this is not a random sample? And a lot of the data sets we have really are just very biased. And there's, they could be, the conclusions within them can be overgeneralized, or we could, they could have our group hom homogeneity bias, which is that we assume that other groups are really similar to the one that we have. And in fact, they're, they're totally not. And the, the thing is, if you start thinking down this road, you realize that machine learning is going to be as biased, most likely as we as human beings are. We are biased beings. Um, but what's important, especially if you have teams that are working together is to document that bias and to, to in, put in as much information as you can into your model documentation that allows downstream researchers, people who are using it or implementing it to understand those biases and to be aware of those biases. And for you yourself to be aware of those biases. And some, I think some interesting biases for me are just this automation bias. And I see this a lot is that the, there's a feeling that just because the, the machine learning model says it to you, it's more true or more fair because it's an automated computational um, machine, but it's really a false sense of fairness because the machine is predicting on all the bias that you're not even aware of that you've input into the data. And so it's really important for us to start really approaching our models, especially if we're part of biomedical organizations with a strong eye and focus on what can be the bias here. Just listing and documenting all the possibilities of where the model could potentially be biased for downstream use. And there's a lot of good information out there on responsible AI practices. And some general recommendations are to always have a human close by, always have a lot of metrics for training and monitoring of your, of your model for bias. Um, obviously, when possible, always examine the raw data. And this is, again, that data science team that sits between compute and research. They have to teach researchers how to examine raw data sometimes. Researchers may not even be aware. Um, and then to really understand and document the limitations of your model and to just test and continue to monitor for those biases perpetually. And there's some great resources for that. Um, and really just start bringing discussions of ethics into your data science teams. I really, really strongly urge you guys um, to start thinking about ways to consider downstream application of using AI ML in our sort of biomedical approaches um, and how we ensure the evolution of this technology and that it's designed to really engage the full diversity of our human experience. And how do we really reach a consensus on ethical standards for new technologies that we're putting into the biomedical space? And sort of what does your organization need to do to um, put in place in order to deal with those challenges? And just some simple things to check raw data, check for missing values, anomalies and values, things that just don't make sense. Always visualize your data in some way in order to check for data skew, um, split and compare your data. And the best is if you can automate these data checking processes. So put machine learning to check the machine learning, <laughs> to put in machine learning in order to sort of find anomalies or check for values and things like that. Because again, these are really tedious tasks for a human um, to have to sit there and look for missing values in data sets. But there are things that really have to be done. And so just overall summary that it's really important to consider the problem carefully. Not every problem that sounds cool needs machine learning. Always ask experts. Awesome if your organization has that data science team that can help you as a researcher. Otherwise, find another expert. Um, and put a lot of emphasis on data prep collection and, and movement and teach researchers to really own that. Like an, a researcher really needs to not always feel like they need an expert at some point, they should start managing their data themselves. Um, always account and document bias and always interpret your um, outcomes and publish, publish them within context. So um, always make sure that you document as much as you can about your model, both internally and externally. And that's it. You guys, um, we can stop recording, Alicia, and then we can just chat for a few minutes.